Thank you so much, comrades, for coming out tonight. Um, it, it means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I too would like to acknowledge that we're reflecting on inequality and injustice on land that always was and always will be Aboriginal land, uh, land that was stolen, never ceded. And I'd like to pay respects to the spirit of the First Nations peoples, their spirit of collective dreaming, their spirit of collective resistance, their spirit of collective hope, because by Christ we need it now. Um, I'd like to um, begin with a, a little story. Um, uh, there's poetry in the in the title of the of the lecture or the speech tonight, and um, it just uh, blows me away that I'm being asked to talk about poetry at all. Usually, I talk a lot about politics, and I certainly talk a lot about class. I sort of weave poetry into everything sneakily, you know, hoping that no one will notice. Um, but um, it's just really beautiful to be asked specifically by, by the ACTU, as, as uh, Meredith mentioned. Uh, it, uh, it's an enormous privilege and joy to be able to talk about poetry. Um, I, uh, a few years ago, um, my son, when he was probably in about year 12, uh, he and I were sitting in the yard uh, after doing a bit of yard work and um, he, uh, he looked down at my feet and uh, he said, you know, Papa, you're getting old man's feet. Uh, your feet are looking like nunnels. Nunnel is the Maltese word for grandfather. And um, he was being a bit of a smart ass, but he's, you know, he's also a truth teller, you know, and uh, you, you can't knock that. So... Um, I, uh, I graciously accepted the observation that I, my feet are ageing and, um, and so then I decided to do a whole big bullshit spiel, you know, and capitalise on the moment and enjoy it and I just said to him, you know, son, I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, you're very observant. You can actually tell a lot about a person by looking at their feet and I just made up all this <laughs> bullshit about, you know, what you can learn about a person from their feet. And, um, and he just sat there, he was, he was used to me um, banging on. And then he goes, yeah, yeah, you're right, Papa. Actually, I can tell by looking at your feet that you're a poet. And that took me a bit by surprise. I said, how, how can you tell that, son? And he goes, well, for the whole time we've been sitting here looking at him, you haven't fucking shut up. <laughs> 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 Comrades, um, the reason I tell the story um, is, um, uh, you know, yes, he was right, um, uh, and I'll bother the the the, uh, the the sequel to the story is, we were going for a walk a couple of weeks later, and he was telling me about his English teacher, that um, and saying, oh, you know, uh, you know, she just she just talks about, you know, she just tells stories all the time, and I'm so, I'm saying, oh, that's kind of good, you know, that's nice, and he goes, yeah, but you know, she just goes on and on and on and on, and uh, yeah, she he said she doesn't shut up, and I and uh, I thinking I was being quite quick witted, said to him, um, so Gian, is is she a poet? And he goes, how do I know? I haven't seen her feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> always one step ahead, you know. <laughs> Um, but the reason I, I uh, tell the story is because um, that, that definition of, of a poet that uh, yeah, Gian gave me, in, in a way, is the definition of the union movement, because we won't shut up. Um, they want to silence us. They want to squash us. They want to destroy workers' lives and crush workers' souls. But we won't shut up. They want to render us illegal. They wish to criminalise advocacy. They wish to criminalise our, our um, ability to organise, to organise hope, to organise resistance, to organise uh, a sense of solidarity. Uh, but we will not shut up. And in the words of the great Indian writer Arundhati Roy, you know, there is no such thing as the voiceless. 
there are only the deliberately silenced and the preferably unheard. And that's why we exist, comrades, because we are the vehicle, the collective vehicle for uh, the deliberately silenced and the preferably unheard. And we will not be silenced. We will not be silenced. Um, the word neoliberalism is often used to describe the kind of assault on the working class. And I just want to share with you what I think that term means. Uh, neoliberalism has been described by the proponents of neoliberalism as simply the government getting out of the way so that the market can work its magic and things will sort of find their, their uh, level of fairness and uh, efficiency and all the rest of it. Uh, but neoliberalism is not about governments getting out of the way. Neoliberalism is very much about government stepping in, intervening on the side of the ruling class, on the side of big business interests. So it's a bit like a schoolyard uh, where a small elite of bullies rule the, the yard and they do whatever they like. They flush kids' heads in the toilets and they steal everyone's lunches. They just do whatever they like. And the neoliberal discourse is sort of saying, oh, well, the principal of the schoolyard is like the government and the principal is sort of saying, look, let kids be kids they'll sort things out, you know, let's call it nature. And of course, nature is the word insidiously rolled out to describe very deliberate history. Sexism, patriarchy, uh, you know, is history, but it's described as nat natural. Um, Colonisation, described, you know, the, the, you know racism, described as natural that the superior races had to, of course, bring civilization to the inferior races. Nothing could be more insulting, but it's described in that discourse as natural. And the same with class-based oppression. It's described as natural, that the entrepreneurial smart people, of course, are going to control um, the means of production and the rest of us who aren't quite as bright and not quite as, uh, you know, haven't got a stronger work ethic, not quite as, as, uh, as you know, um, charged to, to work hard, uh, not quite as enthusiastic. Uh, well, of course, we're going to, to, uh, to bear the brunt of inequality. And of course, the people who are right at the bottom of the heap in this, in this uh, neoliberal nightmare are the people who are told that they deserve to be where they are um, in poverty and uh, homelessness and experiencing the brunt of inequality. <clears throat> I'll never forget a woman I spoke with uh, in Melbourne uh, who was standing on, uh, sitting on the corner opposite Melbourne Town Hall uh, asking everyone who went past for, for some, uh, some uh, spare change. And she was getting angrier and angrier because people were giving her a wide berth. Uh, and, uh, and I went over and, and had a bit of a yarn with her. And she, she said to me, look, I'm not asking for housing. I'm not asking someone to solve my homelessness. Uh, all I'm asking for is enough money to buy a, uh, a, a, a cup of coffee and a muffin for breakfast. And no one is, is everyone is ignoring me. And then she said, almost by way of apology, and this is what really cut me to the quick and uh, broke my heart, but left me with a lesson I'll never forget. She said, I, uh, she said I, I didn't choose this life, you know. I didn't choose this life, you know. As if she needed to apologise or justify because neoliberal capitalism tells her she did choose whatever she's, ex whatever she's experiencing, it was her choice. You know, uh, and this array of choices is the, the fiction that we're presented with when in fact it's based on a radical constraint of choices when it comes to the essentials of life. You know, a bit like, um, you know, when uh, Malcolm Turnbull was Prime Minister and he was asked about an aged care worker 
um, you know, the, uh, you know uh, how she would benefit um, from, uh, from the tax cuts going to the wealthy uh, that were being proposed. And, um, and you know, he said the, the incredibly offensive um, uh, uh, comment, you know, he said, well, of course, she could, if she wanted to, get a better paying job if she aspired to it. And, yeah, that's the freedom. That's the freedom we have. Uh, so, you know, the neoliberal discourse um, deliberately makes people feel that they are to blame for their own oppression. And, of course, we comrades, we know that nothing is further from the truth. And the reason, um, the reason neoliberal governments hate the union movement so much is because, um, you know, they arm those bullies with sticks. They don't stand out of the way. They arm those bullies with sticks and tell their intended victims to stand still. And the reason they hate us is because instead of standing still before the sticks of the bullies, we stand up to them. We stand up to them. And nothing frightens the elite more than when the despised are organised. <clears throat> and we are despised. Uh, you, know, you can use no other word to describe the attitude of neoliberal regimes towards the working class. Um, the reason the bullies hate the union movement, uh, the reason they want to try and crush our souls uh, is that there is benefit to them in stripping wages and conditions, in making sure that there is a large pool of people who are unemployed and that people are humiliated systematically whilst they are unemployed, um, whilst trying to wage that daily struggle um, from below the poverty line, that daily struggle for survival. Uh, because it's useful to that class that people should be made to feel grateful for whatever they get, the crumbs that fall from the table. Um, comrades, you know, we have an obligation to ourselves and to the people who are really pushed right to the edge. We have an obligation uh, not to think and act as supplicants, grateful for the crumbs, but to think and act as revolutionaries, wanting to turn that system of values completely upside down. Because the way it is structured now, it is no accident that people are pushed to the edge. It is systematic and it is deliberate. Uh, and so we have an enormous weapon at our disposal. And, you know, they can do all sorts of things to us but our not-so-secret weapon is called solidarity. And it's not an empty word. It's not an empty gesture. It means standing together. And those who do not practice it will never understand it. But we understand it because it's not a cheap gesture. It's standing together in the shit. It's standing together in a sense of really feeling, really knowing that an injury to one is an injury to all. That I cannot experience liberation if my comrade is in chains. And so we must think through the history of the union movement and the labour movement, think to the times when we have failed in that historic mission, that historic obligation. And the times when we have particularly failed are the times when, forsaking that principle of solidarity, we decided to stick with who we thought were our understanding that solidarity knows no bounds when it comes to the working class. So, uh, you know, the, the, the union movement's history of uh, its time of being very masculinist, uh, very gendered, was a time when uh, the struggle was not conceived in feminist terms, but that the class struggle was considered to be a struggle 
um, for and by men, that this was the industrial subject, was men. And so, it, you know, you could never achieve liberation uh, whilst subscribing to a sexist agenda and, in a way, giving in to the patriarchy. Uh, same with the white Australia policy, um, that parts of the union movement uh, not only supported but sponsored. Again, uh, how can we achieve liberation when we decide that what's good for the working class in white skin is not good for the working class in black skin? Crazy. But we did it. We allowed that to happen. And so we are faced with a historic challenge, but one that I think is very beautiful and one that I believe there is a growing surge of uh, an outpouring of enthusiasm and love for, and that is understanding that all struggles are interconnected, that I cannot truly commit to my struggle and think that somebody else's struggle does not matter. The other example that I would like to give of that separated um, you know, lack of solidarity is the treatment of unemployed people and sole parents and people with a disability and uh, students and uh, older people, uh, people with caring responsibilities. Uh, you know, again, um, there has been a tendency to separate that struggle away from the workers' struggle. And again, nothing could be further from the truth. These people are residualised members of the working class. And we must never forget that, uh, you know, we are all part of the same class um, and our interests are quite opposed to the interests of those who care only about profits rather than people. And that, uh, you know, by punishing and humiliating people who are unemployed, we do nothing for the cause of those who are in paid employment. In fact, we help drive wages down. And so it's great to see the union movement really rising to that challenge of seeing the convergence of, of those struggles that, uh, you know, you can't hive off one struggle from another. Um, when we speak of the Ensuring Integrity Bill uh, as a, a prime example of the assault on organised labour in this country, uh, we know that it's simply an example of that neoliberal desire to intervene on behalf of the bullies. And so we know that it would never ensure integrity. What it would ensure is inequality and injustice. Uh, if, if the government didn't despise workers, uh, how, how else can you explain that the, the, the list of things it has done on behalf of inequality? Uh, whether you look at the superannuation freeze, um, that uh, you know, since 2014, the average worker has lost over $4,000 um, uh, over the last five years and take-home pay has declined by more than $1,000 in real terms, giving them a net loss of around $5,500 for that period. That's an assault on working people. Um, the same with when you think about it, sports rorts, is, you know, by its flagrant disregard of eligibility and need and uh, the foregrounding of uh, class and electorate, Again, this is a, a, a very blatant way of saying we despise working people in their communities. Uh, so too with robo-debt, a systematic way of harming and hounding people instead of helping them uh, and uh, you know, using the organisation, the institution that was designed to help people, using it to, uh, to, to hound people. I want to focus in on what is used to divide us, though, um, because when you think about it, um, our unity scares 
those people who purvey neoliberalism. So what do they do to try and divide us? Well, they, they sow the seeds of racism amongst us. They sow the seeds of sexism amongst us, of homophobia, of transphobia, of ableism, of ageism. Uh, all of these means are rolled out so that unwittingly in some cases and consciously in others, uh, we turn against the members of our own class instead of seeing the unity of our stories, for nothing is more powerful uh, than our stories. You know, they can, they can take away a lot, but they can't take our stories away from us. Um, I don't know about you, but I often feel disheartened <clears throat> when lies are told about us. And it happens all the time, it becomes normal. Uh, we know that lies are told about us as a movement and we know that lies are told about, about uh, our intentions as a movement and lies are told about people who are suffering and nothing is more galling. However, when we hear those lies, when we are disheartened, I would say to you, we need to speak the truth to each other. We need to tell our stories to each other and speak the truth courageously. Because the more we tell the truth to each other, the more likely we are to believe it ourselves. And it's very tempting to doubt ourselves. Comrades, there's nothing more powerful than the truth being spoken by the people pushed to the margins. It will drown out the lies told about us. But in order to do that, we can't doubt ourselves. We've got to have a sense of self-belief. You know, there are sections of the labour movement that are taught and are teaching to believe more in the markets than in ourselves. But we must believe collectively in ourselves. It's all we've got. And when you tell that truth, the truth of your own story, the truth of the people that you stand in solidarity with, uh, remember this too. If you deprecate your own voice, you deprecate the authority of the truth you're speaking. And I'm saying this to you in all honesty because I know it is a struggle. I know sometimes the environment we live in and work in teaches us to doubt and to deprecate our own authority. But we have the authority to speak that truth and we must do so in an unvarnished way. Uh, that's what real courage is. Courage means to have heart. And by speaking that truth, we will always have heart. I want to make a, a couple of comments about, about uh, class. Uh, because it's often a term that is misunderstood. Um, there are those who would say that uh, class is dead as a category, uh, that we've become so egalitarian and everyone's got a fair go and everyone can have whatever they want. Um, yeah, keep on believing that if that's your fancy. Um, but we know it's not true. Um, I think the most useful way, and I'm not speaking theoretically here, I'm speaking in an organisational sense, the most useful uh, lens, if you like, is to look at the interests that govern the politics of, of our society. Um, so we know that politics is a struggle between two tendencies. On the one side, there is the tendency to concentrate power in the ha and resources in the hands of the few. On the other side, there is that struggle, that tendency to disperse, to share power and resources amongst the hands of the many. So that's really, I, th I think, what politics amounts to, is that tension between those two tendencies, between parties and within parties, to be honest. Uh, and so, in that political struggle, uh, we need to be aware of, of how that works. And so, 
if we're going to understand class, we need to understand it in terms of that struggle rather than as an abstract category. And in terms of that struggle, the, the real interests are polarised between those who really own the capital and who benefit most from profits and those who do not. And that includes people who are very well paid in very good jobs, people who are very badly paid in highly casual and precarious jobs, people who are in unpaid labour, particularly women in caring, uh, in, in unpaid caring work, um, right across the majority world to the, the vast informal economy uh, that, uh, that really holds the rest of us up and uh, provides many of the goods that we enjoy as part of our standard of living. So if we sense and feel the unity of all those uh, different sections of the working class, I think it throws a different light on how we look at the struggle because we're taught at the moment that working class is, is a very distinct cultural uh, phenomenon to do with blue collar blokes, um, to do with particular industries, particular cultural uh, choices and predispositions and all of that might be interesting and valid sociologically but as far as the struggle goes uh, it bears very little on the truth of what we are fighting for. Um, if we want to talk about sort of subdivisions or subfractions within the working class, I guess I'd break it up this way. The organised, those who are organised in the union movement, the unorganised, and that's who the union movement, the organised need to really reach out to and speak to and tell our story to, and then the deliberately disorganised, those, again, that neoliberalism has gone into the industries, gone into the sectors and atomised the entire workforce so that uh, it might have been organised before, but it has been disorganised by uh, structural and historical changes in the labour market and in the economy. And so that's really, in my view, the battlefield that we're dealing with. So how do we deal with this most effectively? Um, I would like to put it to you, and you, I suppose you've been wondering, you know, when, when's he going to bring poetry back? Um, if you're, you're all hungering for the, for the poetry, aren't you? Um, uh, <clears throat> back, my, my daughter is a, a very fine poet, and uh, I, I love, I love uh, listening to, uh, to her poetry. It's just, it's very bold feminist poetry and it just shakes the room, you know, when she reads. It's just uh, bloody brilliant. Um, but uh, my son, who I've referred to earlier, um, doesn't like coming along to our poetry events that um, Gabriella and I go to. And um, on one occasion, I said to him, oh, come on, son, I was, I was stirring. I said, come on, come on, look, this is the poem I'm going to read. And he goes, no, I don't want to. And I still, I read it out to him, which was a very nasty thing for me to do. I had, I had no right. And, uh, you know, he, he turns to me, he goes, see, this is why you have no friends. <laughs> which is not true. I, I have a couple. <laughs> um, but... In a sense, the struggle that I've been talking about is the struggle to turn what is not poetry into poetry. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, poetry is, is many things. Um, on a very practical level, I would like to suggest to you that it is the techniques used in poetry, and these are, you know, I, I certainly don't subscribe to any elitist view of any art. Um, you know, art is, should be democratic, it should be for everyone, to be enjoyed by everyone, not consumed as a commodity, but celebrated and lived. And uh, there are certainly some societies in the world where it really is lived. Uh, in, in an uncommodifiable way. The Palestinian poet Taha Muhammad Ali writes very beautifully, art is worthless unless it plants a measure of splendour in people's hearts. And I, I would like to say that, you know, 
uh, not only art, but our political um, project needs to uh, plant that measure of splendour in people's hearts. If we can't inspire people by what we hunger for, then it just sort of says, well, maybe we're not hungering for it enough. You know? And what do we hunger for? Well, we hunger for what I believe everyone hungers for, but sometimes we don't articulate very well because our society teaches us to individualise rather than to collectivise. And But, you know, those essentials, you know, a place to live, place to work, or income uh, security if you can't work, a place to learn, a place to heal, a, a, a sense of dignity and respect, culture, uh, all of these things that make us feel human. It's what everyone wants, a fair crack at happiness. It's pretty simple, really. Uh, and whatever we call this, uh, historically we have called this project the, uh, the Democratic Socialist uh, Project, simply about being a, building a society based on the idea of um, from each according to their ability and to each according to their needs, which is the principle that Medicare or Medibank, as it was first envisaged, envisaged, envisaged uh, was based on. You know, rather than paying what you use, paying for what you use, you paid into the system what you could, and you took out whatever you needed. Well, if that's radical, well, you know, fine. But to me, it's common sense, and the Australian public accepted it. Sure, there were a few shit fights along the way to get it there, and it's been seriously denuded since. We're dreaming if we think it's been left untouched. Uh, it's seriously inadequate. Uh, however, the principle is one that, as a society, we accepted. Well, that's from each according to their ability and to each according to their needs. Progressive taxation, same thing. Social expenditure, that's why corporate tax cuts are cuts to social expenditure, you know? Just as increasing profits uh, is coming at the expense of increases to wages. And yet we're taught to pit stupid things against each other. You know, this the, the myth that, well, you know, if you increase super, that's going to cut your wages. Instead of thinking the bigger picture, you know, where does it all come from? You know, looking at the bigger picture as if the pie was just what we, we have to share with it between ourselves. Begrudging increase to new start because that's my taxpayer's money. You know, ridiculous things. Or let's not, fun, not, let, let's not increase funds to health because we need it for housing or vice versa. You know, all of these are essentials. None of them should have to pay the price um, for, for being adequately resourced. Um, so, you know, yes, we can call that, we can call that radical, um, but at the end of the day, we need to frame it as common sense because that's what it is and that's what um, we need to be fighting for. Um, poetry, in a sense, is that ability to frame, to, to concentrate, um, Yevgeny Yevtoshenko, the Russian poet, used to say, um, poetry is life in concentrated form. And so when we are trying to explain, when we are trying to inflame and give people a, a sense of what it is we hunger for, um, that the, the ability to boil things down, to concentrate them in, uh, in a way that cuts to the heart, that tugs at the gut. That, in a sense, is a poetic act. Uh, the other thing about poetry is that it should be, uh, you know, it, it might dance around with beautiful metaphors and metonyms and similes and all the rest of it, but in a sense, there should be, for practical purposes, a certain clarity, uh, like water, um, that, that gives strength, that gives uh, life and there are challenges as to how we communicate, how we tell our story, particularly to those who need, who, who we want to join us because alone we will never achieve the social justice and social change that we yearn for. Um, but the, the poetry in a sense too is 
the beauty, that splendour in our hearts that we want to build as a society. We want a, a society that is like a poem that nurtures our souls, that connects us. Um, you know, poetry should be able to uh, reach out to people and make them feel that they are not alone. But neoliberalism and patriarchy and colonisation tells you you are alone. You deserve whatever suffering you're experiencing. You're on your own. No one else is like you. Whereas our collective is all about saying our stories have so much in common and yet we're taught to divide ourselves from each other. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I was thinking about this and I just I, uh, I wrote uh, the other day that there, you know, as far as our job is to make into poetry that which is not poetry, uh, I think about some of the things that are not poetry today that we are challenged by and that break our hearts. Uh, and, you know, a poet and an activist should never avert their eyes. We have no right to look away. Uh, that's really completely against what our movement stands for, looking away. And the term respect means to to look at. And the term record means to pass back through the heart. And that's what we do. That's our act of poetry, is our, our daily act of resistance. Uh, there's no poetry in femicide, no poetry in humiliation or degradation, but there is poetry in resistance, in remembering, in retelling, in recording, passing back through the heart, in reviving, in respecting. There is poetry in survival, even in defeat, for our defeats are only fragments of our struggle towards victory, our elemental rhythm in turning things upside down. Revolution means turning things upside down. There is no poetry in oppression, no matter how much the oppressors buy poetry and turn it into marketing. There is no poetry in oppression, but there is poetry in revolution. Uh, comrades, I'd like to, um, to suggest to you that um, our challenge really is simply to know how to speak the truth. And it is something that uh, I feel very privileged uh, to, uh, to go around the country um, speaking with many uh, union um, audiences particularly and it's very powerful for me hearing people tell the truth and it gives strength to each other's arms when we hear the truth being spoken and again it feels like it's against all the odds uh, but you know uh, it it cuts through when people hear the truth. People have an inbuilt bullshit detector. It's not just about what I experience, but about those I love. Uh, and really, you know, particularly as we face a uh, climate emergency, um, you know, and we think, you know, the, the fact that we have failed so uh, completely, so so spectacularly, um, to avert uh, the climate emergency, again uh, is is testament to the fact that the neoliberal discourse has individualised us so much to think, well, this doesn't matter to me. It's not hurting me, and of course the bushfire crisis of the, of the last summer has completely blown that out of the water, and people are starting to say, well, this is impacting on me personally. Um, but the way we uh, um, addressed, the way we dealt with that as a society, well, we didn't. Under Scott Morrison's leadership, there was no leadership, there was no vision, uh, there was no sense of the social. And again, uh, and, and, and you know, with, the, with the current coronavirus uh, crisis, um, you know, there is no sense of the social and it's that sense of the social, that sense of the collective, 
having a strong collective social infrastructure, a strong sense of the social good that the economy should be focused on, a strong sense of us being in something together rather than every person for themselves. Um, at times of crisis, <clears throat> that is really uh, not only tested but highlighted. So we're at a very interesting time. I think uh, Sally McManus is uh, doing an absolutely brilliant job, um, for example, in highlighting the, uh, the, the precarious nature of work in Australia at this time and making the very obvious and real connection between um, the inability to access paid sick leave and the public health crisis that, uh, that we are staring down the, down the barrel of. Uh, so I'm going to um, uh, stop there and take some questions. Before I do, uh, I would just like to say um, that I really, uh, again, am very touched that you are here tonight. Uh, and I would like to conclude with the beautiful words of Auntie Lilla Watson and a group of uh, First Nations activists from Queensland. Uh, if, you have, if, if you have come to help me, she said, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Thank you, comrades.